Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, Bangladesh and the face-off in Dhaka over what can and cannot be said in the papers, on the airwaves, and online. Syria goes offline as word comes out on the fate of at least one, possibly two, missing American journalists there. Meet Nate Silver. He crunches the numbers and proves the pundits wrong when it comes to political polls and what they mean. And from Russia with road rage. Our web video of the week. We begin this week with yet another country where journalists are paying the price for blasphemy. The country is Bangladesh and like Pakistan and Egypt before it, this is a conflict that pits Islamic fundamentalists against secular voices in the media. Bangladesh has no specific anti-blasphemy law on the books, but political movements like the Hifazat e Islami or the Protectors of Islam want one. And they are targeting a group of online activists they call the atheist bloggers of Shabag Square. Two months back, we reported on the protests in that square, which is in the capital, Dhaka. The demonstrations were sparked by war crimes trials over Bangladesh's War of Independence in 1971. At the height of the unrest in March, one blogger was killed, another four were arrested. Mainstream media organizations have not escaped unscathed. News outlets aligned with groups like the Hafazat e Islami have been shut down by the government of Sheikh Hasina. For the Bangladeshi authorities, this is a difficult balancing act. How to preserve freedom of speech when one side stands accused of blasphemy and the other of inciting murder. Our starting point this week is the secular fundamentalist divide in Bangladesh. There's an important battle taking place in Bangladesh uh, about freedom of speech. We have seen, unfortunately, that uh, the, um, the level of intolerance has increased with the polarization. We also have a situation where opposition media is being closed down. So the media or the, any writer, they have to take care. Uh, when they're talking about religion on the other, one hand and about the war crimes trials on the other hand. The wider issue is, of course, is Bangladesh going to remain a secular country? Once again, the streets of Dhaka have been overrun by demonstrators. First, it was one faction, mostly secular, demanding death sentences for those found guilty of war crimes. On May 6th, another faction, religious fundamentalists supporting the Hifazat e Islami party, who opposed the existence of the war crimes tribunal came out calling for an anti-blasphemy law to target the writings of a growing band of secular bloggers. The number is in dispute, but the government says 15 people died in the fighting. And before the night was out, two television channels covering the story, Daganto TV and Islamic TV, were taken off the air. That rally actually descended into chaos when activists of Hafez al-Islam engaged in um, three-way clashes with the police and with ruling party uh, activists. And uh, Digonto and Islamic TV broadcast live some parts of the rally, and it also ran quite extended coverage of uh, these clashes. And we know that um, at night, at about 2 a.m. in the dead of night, there was a police operation to clear this central banking district of these Islamist activists. And at that time, media was ordered out of the area for a period of about 45 minutes to an hour. Digonto TV uh, did broadcast images from there, and it, um, it said that there were casualties, that at least 24 people had died. The government felt that Digonto was actually inciting people and they were inciting the people to stay and continue the city. And they thought that this is going beyond their remit as a broadcaster, and they said that their guidelines specifically prohibit them from broadcasting anything that incite crowd violence or incite um, activities which are not seen to be in uh, favor of uh, public order, stability. They were shut down because uh, the channels were uh, exaggerating vastly the numbers killed in the demonstrations that took place. It, it seems from numerous reports that some people certainly were killed, but the numbers are enormously controversial at the moment, and that that kind of exaggeration were basically lighting a torch in the country. 
Both of the channels affected are tied to Islamic political parties or movements. A month ago, the Awami League government moved against a newspaper with a similar ideology, Amar Dash, arresting its editor for inciting religious hatred, among other charges. He is still behind bars, and the paper is out of print, but remains available online. This is a power struggle between voices in the media pitting mainstream outlets like Amar Dash and the two Islamic channels against new media upstarts, the secular bloggers credited with or blamed, depending on one's perspective, for starting the Shabag protest movement. What happened was in February earlier this year, they set up a Facebook event and asked people to come to the place called Shahbag in Dhaka and demonstrate against a court verdict which gave life imprisonment to a leader of the Jamaat Islami for war crimes. Now, their position was that that man should be hanged, and that brought this group of bloggers to prominence. These protests were extremely popular, and thousands, tens of thousands of people in the streets for many, many weeks. And the opposition party, the BNP, which is allied to the Jamaat Islami, found it very difficult to deal with that. And one of the ways in which they managed to discredit Shabag was by depicting them as atheist bloggers. And the media was used as a way to distribute uh, that kind of information. They presented a list of 84 bloggers that they, they labeled atheists. And many of those people so labeled would say, we're not atheists, you know, we're, we're, we're questioning people, we're free thinkers, we're not atheists. They were named on an Islamist blog shortly, Rajib was named shortly before he was killed. Rajib Haider was a blogger hacked to death earlier this year. An architect by training and a self-proclaimed atheist, he was considered one of the central organizers behind the Shabag protests. His laptop was found alongside his lifeless body. It's unclear exactly who killed him, although uh, a number of people from a group called Hizbut Tahir have been arrested in relationship to that. Subsequent to that, there have been the arrests of four bloggers, including perhaps the most well-known, Asif Muhyiddin. In fact, he had previously, before Rajib's death, he had previously been knived in the streets of Dhaka in relationship to his writings, and is now in detention along with the other three. These bloggers in many cases are left-leaning secular youth who um, believe in the power of the internet, and they organize through social media platforms. They say that they are fighting for a society that, ba that is based on a Bengali identity, based on language and culture, rather than a Bangladeshi Muslim identity, which is uh, more religious uh, and, and based more on a Muslim cultural uh, and a lifestyle way of thinking. They see the effect of religion on society and on state as a negative thing and they have um, advocated strongly in their work uh, the need for a very secular society and the separation of politics and religion. This struggle for the soul of Bangladesh comes down to conflicting views of national identity, differing definitions of journalism and blasphemy. For those bearing witness, those reporting the story, it is a fight for survival, a fight to have their voices heard. Our Global Village Voices now on freedom of speech and its limits in Bangladesh. The Shahbak movement in Bangladesh was initiated and mobilized by a group of young, independent thinkers. They use the internet to mobilize people for peaceful demonstration, and they do this in a very successful manner. The government is worried about the security situation, and now they started closing down media centers and websites linked to the radical movement. But limiting the freedom of speech is never a solution. Some of the bloggers who have drawn ire were involved in religious defamation in their work. These bloggers wrote incredibly defamatory remarks about the central belief system of 90% of their fellow citizens. It was a hugely irresponsible thing to do. I do believe in the freedom of speech, so do not share some of the demands against these bloggers. But. I believe freedom of speech is closely tied with responsibility and all people of all faiths are due not only rights of religious freedom but also respect. We're always looking for new faces for the program. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the news media as one of our global village voices, just get in touch with us on Facebook or send us a tweet. Our Twitter handle is at AJ Listening Post. And don't forget our free video podcast on iTunes. Just look for the Listening Post, Al Jazeera English, and you'll find us there.
Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Syria went black to the online world this past week in a two-day outage that opposition activists say was engineered by the government. The alarm was raised Tuesday, May 7th, when global internet monitoring sites reported that Syria had largely disappeared from the internet. That same evening, the Syrian state-run news agency SANA reported that a fault in optical fiber cables had caused the outage in both internet and telephone services. But with online communications a key weapon in the information war surrounding the Syrian conflict, opposition groups blamed the Assad government for throwing the switch deliberately. On Wednesday evening, internet traffic was back to normal and state news reported that the damage had been repaired. This was the second outage of its kind since the uprising began in 2011. There was a three-day blackout last November, which the Syrian government blamed on terrorists. Still with Syria, an American journalist who went missing last year is reported to be alive and in government custody. James Foley was working for the U.S.-based Global Post news website, as well as Agence France Press, before he disappeared in November. Eyewitnesses say that Foley was driving towards the Turkish border when he was stopped by armed men in an unmarked car. Until now, there had been no word on his whereabouts. Then on May 3rd, Global Post CEO Philip Balboni was quoted as saying, we now believe that Jim was most likely abducted by a pro-regime militia group and subsequently turned over to Syrian government forces. The information on Foley has also raised questions about Austin Tice, another American journalist who reported for the U.S. news agency McClatchy and the Washington Post. He's been missing in Syria since last August. Iran is about a month away from its presidential election, and the editor of a prominent news website has been arrested, only he isn't a reformer. This is a sign of infighting on the conservative side. On May 6th, authorities detained Ali Ghazali on charges of inciting public opinion. Ghazali edits the Baztab news website, which is run by conservatives, opposed to President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Late last month, Ghazali published an article about an audio recording from back in 2009 in which Iranian conservative officials are heard conspiring to rig the presidential elections held that year. In the recording, President Ahmadinejad reportedly tells officials not to rig the vote. The article implied that Ahmadinejad was holding the recording in reserve to use as a trump card to discredit his conservative opponents. Ahmadinejad's office has strongly denied that the recording exists. The Baztab news site went offline shortly after the article was published, citing what it called technical problems. Meanwhile, the banned opposition website, Kalame, reported last month that the intelligence ministry had briefed editors of all the leading newspapers on the red lines and prohibitions to be observed in the run-up for the vote scheduled for June 14th. One hard and fast rule about journalism and political criticism of any kind in Pakistan is this. You can go after politicians, but watch what you say about the military. A satirical song released online by a Pakistani pop group called Begerat Brigade, or Shameless Brigade, has been pulled off the web just ahead of parliamentary elections there. The song was a pointed attack on Pakistan's armed forces. The singers refer to army coups, proxy wars, media control, and they joke about the danger of getting on the wrong side of some powerful generals. The band says it suspects that the video was pulled by the Pakistan Telecommunications Authority, the PTA, on the orders of the military. However, a spokesperson for the PTA said he was not aware of any such directive. We're going to take a look back now at one of the biggest news stories of 2012, the U.S. presidential election through the eyes and the computer of Nate Silver. Throughout last year, American voters were blitzed by political ads. They were targeted by countless robocalls by the campaigns, and they were hit with a barrage of polls. National polls, state-by-state -state polls, approval rating polls, polls of every possible description. Then the campaigns and the political pundits argued over what those polls meant, which ones were accurate and which ones were not. But most everyone seemed to agree on one thing, that the election was a horse race. It was too close to confidently call. Everyone, that is, except Nate Silver. And he was right, not just about the size of President Obama's victory. He was right on every state. He went 50 for 50. Coming up, an extended interview with Nate Silver on the horse race that wasn't, but first, more about him and his News by Numbers blog that runs in the New York Times, 538.com. It's going to be an exciting night, and how close it will be. Virginia, 
Ohio, still too close to call. We're ready to project Minnesota. President Obama. For anyone watching the returns on election day, it was clear that the winner that night wasn't just President Obama, it was Nate Silver. I am Nate Silver, Lord and God of the algorithm. It's not often a statistician's blog becomes one of the most consulted news sources during an election. But Silver's 538 blog, named after the number of voters in the Electoral College, was one of the biggest draws in the run-up to voting day. The blog is hosted on the New York Times' website, and by the end of the year, the paper said Silver's analysis had been one of the top five drivers of web traffic to the site. 538 was a mini-revolution in the world of political reporting and analysis. In a digital, hyper-connected world with 24-hour streams of news and information, Silver says his secret is to zero in on the information that actually matters, separating the signal from the noise. He spoke with The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi. Nate Silver, welcome to The Listening Post. Thank you. Before you got into the world of media, uh, you know, New York Times political coverage, you were making a living from online poker and baseball analysis. What did you learn from those worlds that you're applying now to political forecasting? So I think when it comes to, to math and it comes to statistics, that having hands-on applied experience is, is really, really helpful. And one thing you learn um, very quickly, if you're going to be any good playing poker, for example, is the balance between luck and skill, what you, what you can control, <laughs> what you can't control, how you can manipulate the odds so it favors you, but you're never going to be sure. So understanding um, how statistics really play out in a real-world context, I think, are things that that, that was helpful with. Last year, when all the news channels and many newspapers in the United States were saying that this election was going to go down to the wire, it was too close to call, you wrote on 538.com that, you know, President Obama was the favorite, that he was going to get enough votes to put him back in office. What were you seeing that political journalists across the United States were not seeing? It's a really basic calculation, in a way, where we're just looking at, at kind of all the polls in each state and basically just taking an average of them. If you look at the polls properly and, and extract um, the signal from the noise, as I call it, uh, then they often don't move around all that much. You don't have that dramatic developments. People are basically deciding on the basis of, of which party are the candidates and, and the economy and, and major issues like war and peace. Um, and so every minor gaffe on the campaign trail, every speech, doesn't really affect things very much. There were a lot of people who were not happy with you when you called that election. Uh, it was not just political partisans. A lot of them were people who call themselves journalists. Sure. So what is it that you were saying that was irritating everyone so much? You know, people in, in, in the press are, are often rooting for the underdog, right? Um, whether it's Democrat or Republican, it's a better story if the underdog comes from behind and makes it a closer race. So I think people who, who themselves are, are, <laughs> are partisans have trouble imagining um, anyone who just actually wants to get at the truth and kind of what scientific objectivity might be. The problem is that a lot of people want to narrow down and, and self-select and cherry-pick the facts they look at, whereas our method is just, look, um, the number of polls in the world is, it's not an infinite number, it's, it's a fair amount, but enough that with a good system, with a good algorithm, you can account for, for them all um, in a systematic way, and that points you to, uh, to a relatively straightforward answer, that the candidate ahead in most of the swing states was, was probably going to win. So in your book, The Signal and the Noise, you say that the ratio of meaningful information, like the signal, relative to the general amount of information that there is, the noise, is declining. And I'm interested to know how you think the media is contributing to that. Um, so part of it is that if you have 20 polls in a given state, um, and 18 of them say that the Democrat is ahead, then instead they'll, that's a boring story, so instead they'll cherry pick the two noisy data points. They'll pick the two that have the Republican ahead instead and, and highlight them. So they're deliberately kind of taking the noise when the noise makes an interesting story. I think in political coverage in, in the U.S., um, people are, are, have very lazy definitions of what it means to be objective, right? Whereas I define objectivity as basically being, being true and testing your subjective viewpoints, because all of your points are subjective by definition, mm -hmm. on, on real data and real facts and, and verifying your beliefs and making experiments, right? That's a very different definition from, um, from journalists who might say, well, quote, a Republican spokesperson and a Democratic spokesperson, and therefore we're being objective. It's like, no, you're just being artificial, and maybe you're being sort of fair in a very 
odd way, um, but but not in a way that anyone with scientific training or a real interest in kind of pursuing the truth would be. It's not every day that um, a statistician gets a space in a newspaper. So your blog is hosted on the New York Times website. Are you the first of a new kind of journalist, a new breed of journalist, like a statisto journalist? Um, you know, there's been uh, uh, what's been called kind of data-driven reporting or computer-assisted reporting for for a few years now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think I think the skill set is is changing quite a bit. Where traditionally the journalist might have an an English <laughs> major and not a math or or a science major, um, and you know, and that means they are very fixated on on narrative. But when we tell stories, and stories are an important code of a way to communicate, you have to make sure the stories are are accurate <laughs> to the underlying facts, mm -hmm. right? And the history of how well election coverage works in terms of accurately characterizing the race says that often these stories are are nice stories, but not more than that. They're very inaccurate and misleading a lot of the time. So, you know, I don't know if there'll be a, a paradigm shift. Um, people who really watch political news every day, they are the hardcore partisans who already know what they think about everything. So they aren't really interested in, in any attempt at, <laughs> at, uh, at analysis, which is, which is open-minded and which is going to change as the facts do. Yeah, it's confirmation bias, basically. Absolutely, yeah. right. So you've written an entire chapter in your book about the television pundit. Yeah. And you've said that their predictions are really no better than a coin toss. So if so, why are they on TV? Well, I guess it's a question for, for you, or not for you, but for the producers of, <laughs> of television programs. I mean, look, um, part of it is that these people are talented uh, entertainers. And that is meant to be a pejorative <laughs> comment, that mm -hmm. you know they're not offering a lot of, of substance. They, they take a certain type of, of conventional wisdom that may be very stale, may not be very accurate at all, and put it in a way that seems interesting. I mean, there have been um, a study I did in the book in academic studies mm -hmm. as well. In fact, one study by a guy named Phil Tetlock found that uh, the more often an expert was on TV, the worse his predictions tended to do. So online poker, beating Las Vegas, <laughs> uh, and now you're beating television pundits at their own game. Where do you go next? I mean, that's a pretty unconventional CV you have. So yeah, the, well, the pundits are much easier targets than the poker players. I will <laughs> say that. Uh, um, so I don't know. Uh, you know, I certainly expect that for the next four years, I'll be doing some version of the same thing. You know, I do expect 2016 to be a very monumental election in the U.S. So you're going to have, I think, a, a major story, uh, a major fight for the kind of soul of the Republican Party um, on the Democratic side. It's probably Hillary or, or a major or fight who. there mm -hmm. as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But it should be a really interesting election to cover. Nate Silver, author of The Signal and the Noise, thank you very much for speaking to us. Of course, thanks. In Russia, car insurance fraud is now so common that drivers have taken to installing dashboard-mounted cameras, dash cams, to stave off bogus lawsuits. The unblinking electronic eyes have captured all kinds of footage from the horror of a 20-cow pileup to a road rage altercation that features a hatchet. With so much recorded drama, it would be easy to write off Russians as a nation of hot-headed drivers. But for every act of ugliness that makes it to YouTube, there are many acts of kindness that would otherwise have gone unnoticed. We've cut our very own compilation of the good and the bad. Life on the Russian Road is our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Thank <laughs> you.